The AMA Moving Medicine podcast highlights innovation and emerging issues that impact physicians and patients today. Hello, this is the American Medical Association's Moving Medicine video and podcast. In recognition of Pride Month, today we're joined by Dr. Carrie Candrian, an associate professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine in Denver, who's going to discuss caring for LGBTQ seniors and addressing disparities during end-of-life care. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Candrian. Several years ago, the National Institutes of Health announced that it was recognizing the LGBTQ community as a health disparity population. Now, there are a lot of letters in that particular acronym. And as we've learned from previous guests here uh, on our update, uh, there are different things that apply. And, and in particular, we're gonna be talking about one population, which are seniors, older adults. So let's start uh, by talking about the health disparity population aspect of this and how we see this designation playing out, particularly for older adults. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me, Todd. In 2016, the NIH recognized the LGBT community as a health disparity population in an effort to really do something about the health-related issues that disproportionately affect this community. Mounting evidence suggests that LGBT communities have less access to health healthcare and higher burdens of certain diseases. And so, but, but unfortunately, the extent of these, these disparities have not been fully understood. And research on how to really close these gaps is lacking. So by becoming a health disparity population, it really is a way to, I think, help make LGBT research um, more important, take it more seriously, be better coordinated, and hopefully we'll ensure that LGBT people, particularly older LGBT people, are actually included in the research process and part of the evidence. And you say we got a, a lot to learn here uh, in this particular realm. What do we know about what's driving the disparities? Um, we do know, so I think, I mean, when you think about serious illness and, and end of life, I mean, these are, these are hard events for everyone, but they're even harder for, for LGBT, older adults, um, because they're, they're really entering this last phase of life from a, from a disadvantage in, in really three main areas, financial security, social support, and really the effects of this lifetime of, of stigma and discrimination. First, financial security, one out of three older LGBT adults live at or below the poverty line. And there are a number of factors um, for, that contribute to this, but just to name a few, Gay marriage wasn't legalized until 2015. So if you did have a partner, you were often denied spousal benefits and pensions, which really matter as you age. A second driver for financial insecurity is really job discrimination for their entire lives. If they were open about who they were, they could be fired for, for, for that. And many of them were. Second, family support. LGBT older adults are, are two to three times less likely to be married. And they're three to four times less likely to have kids. They're often more likely to be estranged from family, which means they're aging with a, with a really thin network of support. And a, and a final factor that really is the undercurrent to all of this is, is the effects of this lifetime of stigma and discrimination. But it takes a serious toll. Research shows that this leads directly to higher rates of anxiety, depression, substance abuse, certain cancers, cardiovascular issues, and suicide. And the big one is that the stress of hiding this fundamental part of who you are actually takes up to 12 years off their lives. That was from Harvard Medical That's Magazine. That's incredible. Yeah, in 2020. Um, so obviously, I mean, the factors that you just laid out there are, are obviously having a huge effect, not only on lifespan, but on mental health. Yeah. Um, are there any other ways that that is characterized? Yeah, it is. I think when you when you think about this generation, those who grew up in the 40s, the 50s and the 60s, I mean, being gay or, or lesbian or trans was unthinkable. It was it was really dangerous and it was illegal in most cases. And according to the American Psychiatric Association, I mean, they listed homosexuality as a mental illness until 1973. And so this stigma, I think, that they grew up with really stays with them and has serious costs as they as they age. And as a result, for these seniors who grew up in this culture, they've really developed what I call this habit of silence around this core part of them themselves that be really became a critical defense strategy that they've used for, for decades. 
But this habit of silence takes a serious toll on their mental and, and physical health. Uh, one thing you also uh, point out is as we move into end of life care, mm -hmm. uh, which is difficult under any circumstances, of course, um, that there are specific concerns. Um, you co-authored uh, an article that was published in The Gerontologist during the pandemic that looked specifically at disparities in end of life care for LGBT uh, older adults. Mm -hmm. uh, why is this population at particular risk for receiving inequi inequitable end of life care as well? Yeah, it's it's a great question. I think you know when you think about end of life, you I think we often think about how important it is to be able to be able to express what you want, what you don't want, who you need in the room to advocate on your behalf, who you need in the room to hold your hand, who you need to identify if you're no longer able to speak on your behalf. The thing is, is, is if you can't say these things, it's very hard to have these things. And so all that really contributes to inequitable care for, for end of life, um, end of life for, for older LGBT adults. But let me give you an example and I'll, and I'll keep, it, keep it brief. Um, Esther, I met about three years ago as part of my research. And when I met her, she'd recently lost her wife, Kathy, to cancer. And the thing was, was that when the hospital staff realized they were a couple, Kathy's care got worse. And so they felt like they had to hide their relationship. When I asked Esther what the hardest part of the whole thing was, I remember her saying she was dying and I couldn't even say we were married. Hmm. And since they were hiding their relationship, Esther couldn't be in the room. She couldn't talk with a care team about next steps. She couldn't advocate for her wife on any level. She couldn't even hold Kathy's hand. And when Kathy died, nothing. No one said a word to Esther. She was just the, the good friend, the emergency contact, not a grieving spouse who just lost the love of her life. So no one acknowledged her loss and no one offered her grief support. And Esther and Kathy had been together 33 years. The reason I share Esther's story is that communication really affected the outcomes of, of two people. Kathy's care got worse because she couldn't have the person she needed to advocate for her care in the room with her. And Esther didn't get the support she needed as Kathy's, as Kathy's spouse and really the caregiver. And this is not right, but unfortunately, this actually happens to a lot of older LGBT adults when they face end of life, either their own or their partners. And really for them, and at any point in healthcare, they, they face a choice. I mean, do I come out and, and risk being treated worse or do I, do I stay silent and hide a fundamental part of, of who I am? And it's a heck of a choice. And it, it sort of is with them throughout the healthcare experience and just really magnifies at the end of life. It's a really heartbreaking story. Um, yeah. Do you think that that is, uh, the, the end of life care uh, is different from other areas of healthcare where we don't see such huge gaps? I think the gaps are still there. I think just though they do just become so much more magnified and the stakes are just that much higher when you are facing end of life or you're navigating the complexities of a serious illness. Is there a, 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 a data or um, other kind of sy sy system level problem here that accounts for the gap? Yeah, I mean, I think we know like the drivers kind of of the discrimination. We know it's happening all throughout the healthcare ecosystem and hospices and hospitals, assisted living. Um, the American Heart Association reported last year that 56% of LGBT adults report experiencing some form of discrimination from a healthcare provider. And for those who are trans or gender nonconforming, it goes up to 70%. So we know this discrimination is, is happening. Um, and a 2020 survey of over 850 hospice professionals led by doctors um, Gary Stein and Kathy Berkman, 43% of the staff reported directly observing some form of discrimination towards LGBT patients and caregivers. So we have data that we know these disparities are, are happening. The, the, the huge problem though is really we just don't have great data on the LGBT community and in large part because we don't ask, we don't routinely collect sexual orientation and, and gender identity data. Talk a little bit more about that, how, 
How can that change? Yeah, so since 2011, um, the Joint Commission has asked for, for these data to be collected. The CDC, the NIH have all encouraged the routine collection of, of sexual orientation and gender identity or, or SOGI data, as it's called for short. And I think the one, well, there are several, fa the fa several factors um, to this. I, so we don't routinely collect this information. Um, I think on the one hand, I think people can be uncomfortable asking these questions or they don't see the need to know this information when caring for someone or they don't know when to ask or how to ask. Another thing is, is that for LGBT patients and, and their caregivers is that this is still very scary to disclose this information. Um, they can still be denied care. They still are being denied care sometimes if they disclose this. So if it's not, if these questions are not asked in a way that, that doesn't perpetuate discrimination, we still won't get this, this data. And I think we've seen places that are adding these questions onto the forms, which is an excellent start. I think though, without the proper training on really why these data matter, how to ask in a way that patients feel safe and, and, and trusted, and a way that, the, that they can understand that these questions are not just about knowing if someone is, is gay or trans, but it's actually really critical information to someone's care. You took care of the nation. It's time for the nation to take care of you. The AMA stood by America's physicians and patients during the pandemic, and we're not stopping there. We're fixing prior authorization, leading the charge on Medicare payment reform, supporting telehealth, fighting scope creep, and reducing physician burnout. It's time to rebuild, and the AMA is ready. To learn more about the AMA Recovery Plan for America's Physicians, go to ama-assn.org slash time to rebuild. So I think it... Yeah. yeah, when you talk about uh, how to have that conversation, I mean, it sounds mm -hmm. like there are a lot of obstacles in the communication part of this. Mm -hmm. One of the terms you've used is, is called, uh, quote, breaking the script. Talk to us about what that what that means and how you'd advise uh, uh, people in this situation to gather that data, be compassionate and have that kind of open and honest communication that it takes to have uh, the kind of end of life care that uh, we need. So breaking the script for me is really about reimagining the language we use in, in healthcare. I think one way to, to address the devastating disparities that older LGBT communities face is, is legislation, which is giving protections to people that are that are long overdue. But we can't legislate the way people think and feel, but we can change the way we communicate, the way we talk and, and listen to each other. And for communities that have been historically marginalized, like the LGBT community and in particularly older LGBT adults, changing the way we communicate can really make a measurable difference in the care they receive and in their, their outcomes. And so the, the scripts are really the tools we use in medicine to get to know a patient, our, our forms, our intake questions, our admission conversations, DNRs, living wills. They're critical tools in medicine, but they're, but they're scripted and they're loaded with assumptions that aren't always spoken, but they're, but they're heard. And so for LGBT people who have grown up in these cultures and carry this stigma with them, it can shut people down really quickly. And so the point of breaking these scripts is really to give people space, to allow them to answer in a way that actually fits them and in a way that they can actually share information that, that they need to and, and want to. So the scripts so, like, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. I, I was just gonna say, do you, uh, shining a light on this problem to begin with is a huge first step. Uh, second is making people aware of uh, this kind of approach and the resources mm -hmm. to be able to teach people. Is there anything else that you'd like to see in terms of the evolution of end of life care for this population? And how do we, how do we actually get there? Yeah, I think, you know, I think part of it is just to start doing it. I mean, instead of asking like, are you married? I mean, who's the biggest support in your life? Who do you need to have in the room? Or instead of, you know, we'd like to have a family meeting, who do you consider family? And I think that's the, these subtle changes actually goes, goes such a long way for the LGBT community. And I think for, for me, end of the end of life is really a time of, of reunion and, and reconciliation and to not be able to be who you are, to not be able to have who you love in the room with you or, or at home with you. I just don't think there is really anything more detrimental than that. 
And so I've really committed my career to hopefully making it not so difficult to be able to be who you are when you need it the most. And I think from what I think is so this, this, this avoidable suffering, this, the extra suffering, I mean, is actually avoidable like Esther's and, and, and Kathy's case, because of all the seniors I really met in my research, they're, they're not asking for a lot. They just want to be able to talk openly and be heard without prejudice. And all we have to do is really break these scripts in a way that people feel safe and show them we're safe and, and listen. And I think the bonus then will be is that we'll actually get the information we need to care for these patients and also get data on this community that has been so hidden and so ignored and so invisible for, for so long. Dr. Kandry, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a really moving conversation. I uh, so really appreciate your, your insight and your perspective and advice. Um, that's it for today's Moving Medicine episode. Uh, we'll be back with another one uh, soon. In the meantime, you can see all of our videos and podcasts at ama-assn.org slash podcasts. Thanks for joining us today and please take care. This has been Moving Medicine, a podcast by the American Medical Association. Subscribe to other great AMA podcasts available wherever you listen to yours or visit ama-assn.org slash podcasts. I'm Todd Unger, and this is Moving Medicine.